Greetings, Ruri Wanderer, and welcome back to Lonely TTRPG, the solo actual play and review podcast. First and foremost, I want to welcome you back to another new year. This is year three now. We have just started our third year. We've been doing this for two years now. Super excited about that anniversary. And in some more news, we do have an exciting announcement. We have launched a new product. It is a travel zine for all your TTRPG needs. Wandering World. So every month you will be able to get a brand new location, NPC, adventure, and faction all set in a systems agnostic so that you can visit it from whatever your preferred game is. And if you do go and visit any of these locations, please, we would love to hear from it. Let us know at blackdragondungeoncompany at gmail.com. Also, I do want to give a huge shout out to... Our patron, Kathleen, she has been with us for so long now, over a year and a half. We are very thankful to have you and look forward to many, many more months of providing you content and entertainment. But without further ado, this week we are playing Dead Stick by Friend of the Pod, Croker RPGs. Croker, of course, another member of the League of Extraordinary Soloists. Yes, that league where several solo designers and game players just get together and it's our little way to hang out with each other, talk solo games, and whatnot like that. But with that, Croker has made a new game. Well, new-ish. He did release this a couple months ago. Unfortunately, our December break, that we're getting to it a little late. But diving on in, the war drags on, grinding young people to dust and laying waste to lives and thousands of miles of land. Towns, cities, farms, livelihoods, happiness, and youth are destroyed. The misery is incalculable. Soldiers on both sides fight and live in the mud and filth coming out of their subterranean hovels only long enough to kill and die for a few meters of land. But this is not your war. You are a ground crew mechanic tasked with keeping the sleek fighter planes and their pilots flying day after day. Even as both plane and pilot are worn down to the last pathetic nub, you keep both of them airworthy. This is your hell, watching your squadron fly up and do battle every day, and then every day counting the number that don't come home. You've come to care for these dashing pilots and share in their detached indifference to life and death. Maybe one day the war will end and everyone will be able to go home. What is left of them, that is. But that isn't today. All right, so right up front, if you haven't figured it out, there is going to be some content warnings for this. We are going to be talking about war. We're going to be talking about some of the horrors therein, some of the secondhand horrors of war. The things that, you know, yeah, you're not getting shot in the face or your buddy's not getting shot in the face, but you are watching all the effects and you have limited ability to do anything about that so how to play create your ground crew member by answering the questions about who they are and what defines them then using the war events roll a d20 to determine what event experience or tragedy your crew member experiences write a short story in your journal about what happens to your crew member what emotions they feel and how they react after each event flip a coin to determine the progress of the war Heads, the war is going well for your nation. Tails, it is going poorly. Be sure to track how many heads and tails you flip through the game. Repeat this process until the war ends. Eleven heads and the war ends with a victory for your nation. Eleven tails and your nation has lost the war. Answer the final questions for a victory or defeat. If you roll an event a second time in the game, interpret it as similar, but consider how the event can be more extreme or more destructive the second time. These coin flips count as two progress. If you roll an event for a third time, the war ends immediately in a ceasefire. Everyone along the battle lines puts down their weapons and returns to an unsure home and future. Answer the draw questions. And as an optional rule for a quicker experience, use six coin flips instead of 11. And that's pretty much it. That is the bulk of the rules. Everything else is character creation, which we will go over in just a second as soon as we dive on into the game itself. But, yes, a very simplistic system and very easy to dive into. So without further ado, let us dive on in. So first things first, we need to answer who we are. 
And that's going to start with what country we grew up in. Now, to do this, I'm going to be using a D2 on roll 20. One will be heads, two will be tails. And I'm going to roll 2D2 in order to determine who I am. And I got a heads and a tails. So that means I come from a strict autocracy where free thought is rejected and people must toil for the state. Now, what level of technology do we have? And we got two heads dashing biplanes that were little more than fantasy a decade ago. So we are very early on in this aeronautical journey. And finally, how did the war start? Two tails, mistakenly and without intent by either side, as if everyone was sleepwalking into a disaster. Outstanding. So it seems like I have kind of accidentally recreated World War I. I am in an autocracy. We have biplanes. And everything just kind of started because a whole bunch of random factors all just came together. And I know that's a very simplistic start for World War I. Please don't come at me. So now we've created our world. Let's see who we are. Millions of people have either signed up or were drafted. How did we end up in the military? Heads and tails. We were drafted. And finally, what is our aptitude for mechanic or what did our aptitude for mechanics give us? Why did we pick maintenance? Another heads and tails. It seems safer than other jobs. Better di better than digging trenches or manning a machine gun. All right, so we were a ground crew member from an autocratic nation. We were working on our biplanes as a war accidentally started around us. Like many others that we are work that we are serving with, we seem to have been drafted. But despite all of this, because of our aptitude for mechanics, we were given the option and we took it because it definitely seemed safer than going out on the front lines. So with all that established, it is time now to roll our first dice and see what happens. Starting off with a one. Like you always do when the squadron flies a mission, you stand at the lookout and count the planes returning. You count six, seven, and eight planes, but one is missing. You have a sinking feeling in your chest as you notice that you haven't seen the distinctive tail markings of the squad leader. The sinking feeling quickly turns into a hammer that pounds into your chest. You love the missing pilot, even if they didn't love you back. Who was the squad squadron leader to you? Was your love platonic or romantic? And how will you carry on without them? All right, so I am going to say that the squadron leader was the one who actually noticed our aptitude with mechanics. So it was one of those... They were going through they were going through some of the packets, something about the scores just caught our eye, and they were the ones who pulled us into this life. They they came to us, they offered us the opportunity because they were building the squad. After all, we are very early on in the development of aircraft, and so they were building this squad up. Like they were building their squadron. So yeah, they came to us, they sought us out, they provided us this opportunity. And while we kind of took it for more pragmatic reasons, you know, to be safer, we are still like, we're still grateful to them for providing this opportunity. I'm going to say this love is platonic. They definitely gave more of a, they definitely gave more of a big brother or fatherly type feel to them. Like they, they definitely seemed like when they were building this, they were the, they were the old man of the outfit. And yeah, so everybody, everybody looked up to them. So, you know, this is going to be a particularly hard day as one of the first missions into the war they did not come home on. That is definitely, definitely a wake up call for us. And now to see how the war goes after that, we rolled a heads. So despite, despite losing the squad leader, again, the vast majority of our planes came back. So this was... This was an overall successful mission for our nation. It may not feel like it for us at the moment because of who we lost, but yeah, an overall overall success. You know, one of those bittersweet successes as yeah, we got we got that we got that supply depot. We hit that supply depot and successfully took it out. That's going to make 
it very difficult for our adversaries to provide adequate supplies to their people. <clears throat> but yeah, we still lost our we still lost our squad leader in the process. So moving on to event number two, we rolled a fifteen. All right, you and your crew have worked 36 hours straight. Between planes requiring maintenance, battle damage, and other duties, there is no respite in sight. You even swear you're starting to see things out of the corner of your eyes as the work continues. You slip up, make a mistake, and someone gets hurt. What do you do, and how do you make up for it? Okay, so someone got hurt due to my mistake. And I think, I think what this is going to be is... Working in, we're working in a shack on a makeshift airfield. So, like, it's not like anything here is built up. We built a lot, like, we built a lot of this stuff ourselves or it was built for us. But it was all built very quickly and cheaply because we need to, like, get the planes out there and do the work. And, you know, yeah, we have... We have this makeshift hangar because we need it, but like it's not, but it's not like great because again, you know, very, very makeshift ramshackle. Now, with that, if you've never, if you've never worked in an environment like that before, you have very limited space. You, it's not built for you. Like it's not really built for you. So you have to be very deliberate in where you put things. In fact, I remember after one of my deployments, this is personal life story, actually. I remember after one of my deployments, one of the briefings we got when we got back home was on how we got used to everything being in a certain place so that we could find it quickly and easily. And life at home was not going to be like that. And we need to like, start to work on that so that we didn't like completely lose our minds on our family because of the frustration of this is where things go. This is where it's supposed to be. You know, why is it not here? And so I think we have a similar situation like that going on where, you know, it was a relatively benign and simple mistake. I did not put the toolbox back where it was supposed to go. I did not put it on the correct shelf. Now, the reason why this was a big deal, the reason why this is an issue is because the shelf I put it on was not reinforced to hold the weight of the toolbox. You know, again, everything very ramshackle. So I put this toolbox on this rickety ass shelf that was not made for it or not even like slapped together in a way that could support it. And my buddy was walking by and bumped the shelf like you do. But when they bumped the shelf because of the rickety shelf and the uh, weight in a bad spot and not anything being designed well, like the shelf rocked and broke and the toolbox fell on their foot and they broke their foot. So, yeah, now, of course, I feel bad because, you know, it was my fault that his foot got broken. You know, I helped directly contribute to that. And as far as what I do to make it right, like in one of these situations, it's rough because I'm already working, like we're already working way past any semblance of safety. In fact, in the modern military, at least the modern American military, there are very strict rules on how long aircraft crews and pilots can work and then how much time off they are supposed to get after they get done working precisely so that, you know, <clears throat> you don't have people seeing stuff out of the corner of their eyes, making silly mistakes like that. <clears throat> but again, we are at the very start of this. We are learning all of this along the way. So I don't know, like doing more doesn't volunteering to do more is, is hard to do, but I think, yeah, I think what I'm going to end up doing to try to make it right is like I'm going to like I'm going to bring this guy's food to him. Like I'm going to bring I'm going to bring their meals to him. Um you know, it's one of those injuries that he's not actually getting moved anywhere. Um 
this guy can still work. Just reducing the amount of pressure on the foot and whatnot while while they're trying to work. And of course, they're going to get more breaks and everything for that as well. But like, I'm going to try to make their life a little bit easier by bringing in their chow for a while. Again, because it's a case of they cannot move well because of me. But how did this injury impact the war effort? Tails. So that seems to be negatively impacting the war effort, which makes sense. There are not a lot of us. There are not a lot of us with this skill. And now we have, now we have made a guy not as effective. And so, you know, try that we try that we can to make mission. It's we're not, we're not getting the birds turned out as quickly. They're not, they're not coming in and out of the hangar as fast as they could because you know another one of our experienced personnel is not as effective and try that we might like it's going to take time to fix that knowledge gap that experience gap with the new guys and to get in a situation where you know this guy. So we're not we're not fixing the birds as fast. That means we're doing less missions. We're doing missions with less personnel for the ones that are completely necessary. So yeah, that is negatively impacting our ability to help out with the war effort. So hopefully this next event goes a little bit better for us. And we got a 5. A new enemy pilot has been engaging your squadron over the last few days, scoring several kills. The pilots are desperate for any advantage you can eke out of their machines. What desperate thing do you do to gain just a fraction of a performance from the airframe? Was it enough? Do they blame you if it wasn't enough? Hmm. So now we are definitely entering the experimental. So yeah, we got these biplanes and ultimately, ultimately, again, they're relatively new. They, these biplanes have only been around for maybe 10 years, but like, it's an engine, you know, it's, it's an engine. And I used to work on cars back before the military. So, you know, I used to play around with my car and try to tune it up and everything like that. But let's see, like, I try to do the same thing here. I kind of have a bait, like I have a pretty good understanding of how this engine works because at the end of the day, engines like these biplanes, they're running off of like regular combustion engines. So the principles aren't all that different from my car. And so let's go ahead and try to tune this up the way that I would have my car back home just to try to get a little bit of more performance out of it. But let's see how well I do. Hopefully we get a heads here. No, we got another tails. So we are unable to get any better performance out of this. It's just, I mean, it's just a case of the other side has better built engines and try as I might. There's only so much I can do to our engines, but it's not enough as far as being blamed for this. Like, I think some of it depends on the pilot for the most part, the pilots, the pilots seem to get it. Like there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of frustration because, Hey, you know, do your job mechanic. But at the same time, like we're still, we're still relatively early in the war and relatively new with this technology. So like there's frustration, but that frustration is also mixed with if somebody ever gets a chance to like stop and think logically about it, that, you know, Hey, this is new technology and nobody really knows what they're doing and everybody's doing the best that they can, you know, because nobody's running around, you know, and I think there might've been a blow up. I think one of the, one of the pilots might have, you know, tried to blow up on me and my guys for this. And somebody would have snapped back with, well, why don't you just get better at flying or something along that lines, you know, you know, something along that lines of, Hey, look, we're, you know, we're all doing our best. This is all brand new. Like you guys are barely holding it together as it is as well, you know, and that, I think that light bulb moment kind of, kind of helps everything out. Um, now we all, we all 
after that fight, we all ended up having to stop and think. And I, I know that I wondered if our squadron leader, our old squadron leader who brought us all together was still around, if that would have gotten to that point because they definitely seem like the type who would have had a more tactful and gentle conversation with everybody on this so that, you know, we never got to that level of frustration. You know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. All right, moving on to our next event, event number four. 14. This is a big week. The brass have even come down to speak to the ground crew and the pilots about it. A true rarity. Everyone is going to give everything they have to hit the enemy in the pants. Every airplane, weapon, pilot, and ground crew will be thrown into it. How do you feel about this huge effort? Did it turn out to be the success everyone hoped it would be? So, yeah, this seems like this seems like a very big deal. Everybody's come down, like everybody's coming down, and especially us being the new the newness and a huge combat multiplier just trying to impress upon us all the seriousness of the situation. And like, we all get the seriousness of the situation. Like we're, we're living the effects of these missions every time, but the way that they're acting, it definitely feels like it definitely feels like they're trying to do something because we definitely seem to be coming on like a turning point in the war because yeah, it's been, it still hasn't been horribly long, but we only had that one initial success. We only had that one initial success against some of the logistical sites and everything else seems to be, everything else seems to be turning, turning south. I mean, they got better planes. Our production is still a little bit down. So it almost feels like that you know, everybody trying to cheer, like trying to boost that morale right before halftime of a game, you know, like, hey, you know, I know things aren't looking too great right now. However, we do have an opportunity. Like, it's not over yet. We still have we still have plenty of good opportunities. That's what it feels like. But let's see how well this offensive goes. And it's a tails. That is not a that's not good. That is not good. Because. We threw a lot of resources at this. Like, it seemed like we were trying to turn momentum in our favor, but it did, it did not work out. It did not work out for our side. And because of the amount of resources that we threw at it, it, it's almost starting to feel like it doesn't matter what we do now because, you know, you throw that, you throw that big, you throw all those resources at it and like, we're not getting those resources back. Like those resources that we use, they are gone. They are lost and we're not getting them back. And, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where we're going to find what we need in order to continue on. All right. For our next event, you've been granted leave for the first time in months. You hop on a transport heading out of the air base to the closest town, which has been under your country's control since the start of the war. The people are hostile to you, but don't dare put action to those feelings. What do you do with your slice of freedom from the war? I mean, I'm going to do what every I'm going to do what every soldier does and I'm going to go get drunk. Because because you know, at the end of the day, until we have time to actually deal with this, sometimes we're not going to say it. We are not going to say it. We are not going to we're not going to contribute to poor coping mechanisms on this podcast. Go seek therapy, kids. It is it is important. It took me 17 years before I actually started seeking therapy for my stuff. Self-medication is not the answer. However, that is what my character is doing. They are self-medicating and, you know, just doing, doing hoodlum stuff. Nothing too, like nothing too bad. Like, you know, obviously we're going to, obviously we're going to the place that our people tend to go to after all with this hostile, with this hostile crowd, with this hostile crowd, it, you don't want to, you don't want to go too much onto the locals because you just make a bad situation worse. Anything can happen when the locals are involved and, you know, there are certain levels of conduct that you do need to maintain, 
in order to at least nominally not contradict the propaganda and information campaigns that your country is trying to put out. You know, it doesn't do a whole lot of good for your country to be messaging, oh, we're the liberators, we're the liberators, we're the liberators. And then you go out and get in a drunken brawl with every local that you see. Uh, That does not do good. So, yes, I have freedom, but it's not like I have freedom, freedom. Um, It's been strongly encouraged that I stick to one or two main establishments that have pretty much become the hotspots for us. But on the bright side, we did just roll another heads for our war progress. So a little bit of success for us. And I think we can see that with the local populace. Like we've been here. We've been here a while. We've been doing our best not to cause trouble. And so while yes, you can tell nobody likes having us here. That while yes, everybody would be like everybody would highly prefer if we were not here. Like nobody's doing anything about it. like there's still there's still like kids playing around us when we go out and like there are still people willing to at least grudgingly talk to us. You know, again, a lot of a lot of very angry stares that that def- definitely do not signal good things, but like no 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 outward action that we have to <laughs> that we have to de- that we have to deal with all right and after we calm down a little bit after that let's go ahead and see what our what our next role is uh 13 a new airframe has been delivered and it promises to be the next generation in aircraft design and armament while it is better than aircraft in Almost every way, you were nostalgic for the older model, which got your pilots through a few tough scrapes since the start of the war. What do you and your fellow ground crew do to send off the older model? So honestly, I think this is gonna this is gonna be a bit of a tough one. We are probably gonna end up like helping with the organization of some type of final flight type thing. Like the pilots are gonna all get together and they're all gonna get in the their old aircraft and since we're talking like a major upgrade here, like damn near an entirely new aircraft, not just like improvements on the ones that we have, they're all going to get together and they're all going, we're all going to get them all prepped up for one last flight. And we're going to do one last little flight around our airfield and, you know, have a little bit of a, have a little bit of a celebration as we say goodbye to, as we say goodbye to old reliable. Fortunately, The war continues to not go well for us. So we're going to say that we're going to say that while we were doing this celebration, that all the old airframe were spotted. And like while it was like while our location hasn't necessarily been secret, you know, you don't advertise that type of thing. And so seeing all of these aircraft go up all at the same time and do some, you know, do some stuff around the area, I think we might have spooked somebody um, into thinking something bigger was happening. And they decided that this would be an opportune time to call in for an artillery strike on our location. So we're going to take an artillery strike and... You know, that is going to, that is going to damage the airfield. And because I'm looking for a wrapping up point here, I'm also going to say that I was caught in that artillery blast. So like, this is going to be the end of my character as they were caught up in that artillery blast. And the war does not seem to have been going well for us. We are going to, we are going to answer or go through the defeat section. Uh, When the news of defeat breaks, you know you should be sad or depressed, but the truth is all you feel is relief. At least now the killing and death will stop. Uh, The the armistice calls for all planes and equipment to be turned over to the enemy. You and the rest of the ground crew refuse and start setting fire to the airbase and the planes. What do you feel when you watch the planes you so carefully kept running for so long go up in flames? Back home, friends and family won't meet your eye. Maybe they're embarrassed or ashamed or disappointed. Of you, your nation, or themselves, you aren't quite sure. Discontent 
proliferates as terrible people feed on the anger of the defeated population. How do you respond to these feelings? After a decade or two, the injustice of the defeat have been too much for your nation to handle. In a fit of rage, led by demagogues with hate in their hearts, your country marches to war again. You are called to serve yet again, this time by a nation you no longer recognize. What do you do? So luckily for us, yeah, we don't have to worry about that because again, I said that I died in that final artillery strike. But that is Dead Stick by Croker. What I really like about Croker is that his games are always so thought-provoking. Like, he always asks such interesting questions in his games. And this one, yes, can be very heavy subject matter, especially now, especially with everything going on in the world right now. I can see how this might not, you know, sit well. But, but... There's no there's no good ending to any of this. And I do appreciate that he did not shy away from that. Now, the one thing I do, the one thing I really do enjoy about this is the war progress tracker. Because there are two ways that you can play this. You can play this like I did, where you are having a tangible impact on the war. And having served in aviation units, I know that they can be a very big deal to everything that's going on around them. There's a reason why there's a reason why there are so many safety regulations around them, why they're guarded the way that they are, and you know, why their personnel are protected the way that they are. And it's because the aviation can provide so much to an effort. Now, the other way that you can play this is you can play it so that the war progress tracker is completely unrelated to what you're doing. You know, because after all, you have your very small corner of the war that you're fighting in. And so you could end up doing like two things. You know, you could respond to your, you can respond to your prompts and either flip a coin to see if it goes well for you or not, or, you know, just decide whether or not something goes well or not, you know, depending on how you want to play it and then do your war progress. And so everything can be going right for y'all in your sector. And then you still lose your nation still loses. And I think that's another very interesting way to play it. And it definitely adds a lot more, a lot more spice to some of the answers you can give those questions and some of the answers that you can give those defeat and draw questions, especially if you played it where, you know, you guys were crushing it every time and like you still lost, you know, like how do you, how do you go back to a nation that seems disappointed in you when you know you did the best job that you could? You know, that, that always leads to some inter like that can lead to some interesting thoughts and discussion. Now, one thing that wasn't included that I think should be is definitely some type of, you know, just some type of quick safety tool type thing. I know a lot of this should be very implied on everything, but like, it's really easy to get, it's really easy to get very heavy in this game very quickly, you know, especially if you have some experience with this type of stuff, if you've been in situations like this. Uh, yeah, it, it can get very easy to need to take a break. And so please take that break. Take that break. There's no reason to not take the break. There's no reason not to walk away. You know, like like I said, I, cu I cut my war off early, partly because of time, partly because, you know, I I started having my own flashbacks, you know. And again, nothing nothing major, nothing bad. Like I'm relatively sure it felt worse for me than I was presenting when I was going through it. But yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, yeah, I'm, I'm done now, right now, right now I'm done. I don't, I don't need to keep playing, especially, you know, especially looking at the, the tally mark. All right. I'm four to two for losing the war and I was only going to six. So, you know, there was a possibility, but didn't, not something I needed to press and those type of plays are fine. It's perfectly fine to walk away when you need to, um, especially in stuff like this, especially with everything going on in the world, especially with how you might be feeling about what's going on, how you might be feeling about yourself, how you might be feeling about like events in your past and whatnot that remind might remind you of this. So 
you know, just a quick, you know, just a quick little, hey, remember, this is just a game. By all means, walk away from it. Nobody's asking you to play it to completion. You know, if you're not having fun, take a break, you know. But like outside of that, outside of that, like I said, you know, great game. Really do love the war progress part. I think that was a really good spin on these prompt style journaling games so that because like you got the dice tower that you get with wretched and alone or you have your card matrix that you'll get with carta games and whatnot like that but like those all serve the genre of game that they're going for and for something like this which is kind of like war action adventure type thing you know how do you really serve that genre like what mechanic do you use to help serve that genre and still maintain some level of forward or backward momentum. And the war progress tracker is a great way to do that, you know. And again, I I do love the fact that it is not tied to how you're doing to really help drive home that point of regardless of how you're doing, you are a cog in the machine and the machine is running or stopping regardless. You know, all your teeth can be stripped out and you can just be like a bare wheel spinning and that machine will still go. Or you could be like so well taken care of and cogging your little cog butt off and because the timing belt broke somewhere, everything has ground to a halt. You know, like just having that, I think, is such a great addition to the mechanics. But if you want to pick up Dead Stick, you can at crokerrpgs.itch.io slash dead-stick or click on the link down below. You can get it for the low, low price of name your own price. But again, please remember to at least toss a coin to your croker because we do want to encourage our independent game designers to keep making games. Um, And definitely leave comments. Definitely leave comments. Uh, We all love seeing that on our games. We love seeing what people think about them. You know, to you, it's not much to that, you know, to us, especially when running a small, a small game design studio or what have you, you know, those, those comments are like, Hey, you know, people care enough to interact. So make sure you toss, make sure you toss them at least a dollar. Let them know what you think of the game. Let them know that Steel Stass sent you. And remember, I must ask y'all to stay awesome. This has been a Black Dragon Dungeon Company production. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. If you want to help us grow, make sure that you hit that like and subscribe button and go ahead and leave us a comment down below and share this with your friends. Other ways you can help support the show is by checking out some of our products over on itch.io or drive through RPGs. In addition, you can join our Patreon and get early release access and a chance to ask us any questions that you have. If you want to reach out to us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at BDDC underscore pod, or you can email us at BlackDragonDungeonCompany at gmail.com. Once again, thanks for watching.